Thank you very much, Kevin, and thank you all for being here. A funny thing happened on the way to JFK's presidency at the Democratic Convention in Los Angeles in 1960. After receiving his party's nomination, he extended the offer to run as his vice presidential nominee to Stuart Symington of Missouri. After he extended the invitation and not expecting to hear from Stewart until the next day, Bobby made a pro forma invitation to Lyndon Johnson, who of course had the powerful position of majority leader in the Senate, which neither Bobby nor Jack thought there was a ghost of a chance he would accept. Instead, Lyndon leaped on it, and thereby hangs a tale. Uh, he would tell others later that he was a gambling man, that he'd studied the history of the presidency and found that one out of four occupants of that office had not survived their term in office. But the fact of the matter is that while Bobby and Jack tried to untangle this, Lyndon, using information he obtained from J. Edgar Hoover about Jack's romantic liaisons, reminded him of one with a beautiful woman who turned out, turned out to be a spy for East Germany. They of course knew that he suffered from Addison's disease and to seal the deal Lyndon assured him that if he were not the vice president on the ticket that he would make sure that none of JFK's legislation passed the Senate. So they reluctantly, feeling boxed in, accepted Lyndon who made a big to-do of having been offered the position in a very public fashion and went from there. Now Dealey Plaza is an interesting area, very compact, and it turns out that the motorcade route which would have come up Main Street and could have come forward to the Stemmons Freeway without this detour, in fact was diverted up Houston Street, took a 120 degree turn onto Elm, and then proceeded to the Stemmons Freeway. This was completely unnecessary and appears to have been a result of a phone call that was staged by John Connolly allegedly talking to Kenny O'Donnell at the White House four days before the event in order to manipulate them into changing where JFK would speak to the trademark from the Women's Forum even though the Women's Forum was very secure and had been approved by the Secret Service, the trademark had virtually hundreds of entrances and exits and was extremely non-secure. Dealey Plaza, perfect place for a triangulated assassination. Notice some of the important building here. You have the County Records building just uh, here. You have the Daltex building here. The Book Depository of whom we've heard so very much. The Grassy Knoll, the wooden fence, Number two is the location where the fellow who ostensibly took the film we've been viewing, Abraham Zapruder, stood on a low colonnade. Three is the purported location of a shooter from the Grassy Knoll. Four and five identify locations which are actually below the triple underpass seen here where there are above ground sewer openings halfway between the roadway and the top of the triple underpass. Six is where a man by the name of James Tagg was standing when he was hit by a ricochet from a bullet that hit the curb, which led to considerable problems for the Warren Commission. One is the alleged location where Jack was hit, but in fact it appears to have been 20 or 30 feet further west. Lee Oswald was arrested approximately one hour after the assassination, even though there was no clear identification. He had determined that uh, work wasn't going to continue that day. He'd gone on home. He was arrested at Texas Theater, where he appears to have gone to meet a handler, a contact. And he was confronted there. There's lots of reasons to think that the idea was to kill him at the Texas Theater. And I believe if he'd sought to make an escape out the back, that would have happened. In fact, he deftly managed to survive his arrest. And coming out, when a, when a spectator asked, who do you have there, one of the officers said, Lee Oswald. And there was already conversation about this man having killed the president, which was rather ludicrous given there had been no investigation, no evidence really to incriminate him.
This weapon is one of two which were found in the book depository. The first weapon that was identified was a German Mauser, which is actually an excellent high quality weapon that would have been suitable for an attempted assassination. This was a World War II Mandlicker Carcano manufactured in large numbers by the Italians. It was actually so unreliable, it was known as the humanitarian weapon for never actually hurting anyone on purpose. <laughs> There's a curious feature in this particular photograph, which is that here you can see a clip in the, in the weapon, but it shouldn't be there. The way the Mandlicker Carcano loads, and it has a clip of seven rounds, the clip falls out once you load it. It can't be loaded without the clip, and the clip no longer remains after it has been loaded. Unlike the M1 Garland, for example, which was the most prominent American infantry weapon in World War II, where the clip remains in the weapon until all the bullets have been fired. After the alleged assassin, he's supposed to have raced across the warehouse floor, stashed his trusty man liquor carcano down four flights of stairs and where into a lunchroom where he managed to have a coke. I've often observed this is quite a bizarre scenario and what the bottling company could do with this, Lee Oswald with his man liquor carcano in one hand, bottle of coke in the other saying things really do go better. <laughs> But the fact of the matter is this scenario is completely fabricated. The assassination took place at 12.30, but at 11.50, William Shelley, keep that name in mind, it will come up again, saw him near the lunchroom when he, Shelley, came down to eat lunch. At noon, Eddie Piper, another co-worker, saw him on the first floor when he, Oswald, told him he was going up to eat. At 12.15, Carolyn Arnold observed him sitting in the lunchroom, and at 12.25, she saw him again, but on the first floor near the front door, where Carolyn Arnold was the executive secretary to the vice president of the book depository. He is supposed to have returned to his rooming house by having left the building, uh, got aboard a bus. The bus got bogged in traffic. He got off the bus, approached a cab. Uh, a little old lady, however, also wanted the taxi, so our alleged assassin offered her the cab. Returned to his rooming house where he put on a jacket and took his revolver with him. Now, as I mentioned, he was going to head for the Texas Theater, which is here in the upper right, and it would have made great sense if he continued on the path he'd initiated and then taken a right to the Texas Theater. Instead, according to the official account, he made a detour, which makes no sense at all, going way out of his way, had an encounter with a police officer by the name of J.D. Tippett. According to the government, he, he shot Tippett to death. Tippett was actually shot three times in the chest and once in the head. And then he fled and you know, left his jacket in the vicinity of some automobiles in a, in, a, in a used car lot. But the fact of the matter is that the four shell casings that were found by the first officer had been ejected by automatics. They were of two different manufacturers, two of Western and two Remington Rand. Uh, the first officer initialed them. Oswald, as I mentioned before, had a revolver, and it would have been quite absurd for him to shoot a police officer, then open the cartridge casing and remove these incriminating shells, which were not even of the right type. It would eventually turn out that a substitution was made in the evidence, and the original automatic shell casings were replaced with revolver casings. The initials that had been placed on them originally disappeared, and now there were three of one manufacturer and one of the other. An excellent discussion of this may be found in Robert Grodin's book, The Search for Lee Harvey Oswald. Now this is a very uh, stunning photograph uh, showing Lee Oswald holding his man liquor carcano, wearing a pistol belt with a revolver notice, and two communist newspapers, one the militant, one the worker. But if you take a close look, something doesn't look right. For example, his chin. You may recall from that initial photograph, Oswald had a pointed chin with a cleft. This chin is a blocked chin. There's also an insert line between the lower lip and the chin. The fingertips of his right hand here on the newspaper appear to be cut off. These are not the only anomalies, but nevertheless, this photograph was published on the cover of Life magazine and used to incriminate him in the minds of most 
citizens of this nation. Jack White, a legendary photo analyst, realized that those newspapers had known dimensions, so he used them as an internal yardstick to determine the height of the individual here, and found that using this yardstick, he was too short to be Lee Oswald, who was about five foot ten. Turned out to be only five foot six, which e means either they used somebody who was too short to be Oswald to impersonate him for the purpose of these photographs, or they, more likely, they introduced the newspapers too large. When Oswald was shown th this photograph, he said that it was his face posted on somebody else's body, and that he'd be able to prove it. And since there are three or four of these photographs, we've been able to superimpose them and discover that although they're in different poses and the body's at different angles, the face is nevertheless indistinguishable from photograph to photograph, which would be optically impossible if these are genuine photographs. So what Lee was telling us about these photographs was in fact true. He also passed his nitrate test. He had uh, no nitrates on his cheeks, which indicated he, he'd fired neither a carbine nor a rifle. He did, however, have nitrates on his hands, which was doubly exculpatory because having nitrates on his hands showed that he had not washed his hands to wash the nitrates off his face. Plus, the nitrates on his hands were readily explicable because he worked in a book depository handling books which are printed in ink which contains nitrates. Now here, as I mentioned, the assassination went down at 12.30. Here's his arrest report dated 1.40. And it states, this man shot and killed President John F. Kennedy and police officer J.D. Tippett. He also shot and wounded Governor John Connolly. Well, that's quite remarkable in logic. We call this begging the question by taking for granted a conclusion that deserves independent corroboration. An hour after the assassination had gone down, and they're already claiming in the arrest report that this man shot and killed President John F. Kennedy? How absurd. It should say, if it were honest, something like this man was suspected of possibly being involved in either the shooting of the officer or something to do with the president because they really had no evidence at all that Lee Oswald was I I implicated in this crime. Now, there were a number of oddities that took place involving the Secret Service the morning of the motorcade. For example, two officers, two Secret Service agents who would normally have ridden on the back of the limo or, or, or run alongside of it, were left behind at Love Field. This was very strange. And you see one of them, Henry Repka, looking back at Emery Roberts, shown here, who was waving them off. Emery Roberts was in charge of the Secret Service detail and his behavior that day was extremely suspicious. The motorcycle escort was cut back to four and they were instructed not to ride ahead of the rear wheels. This was a very odd formation. Indeed, one of the officers said it was the damnedest formation he'd ever seen. But it's very clear that there were excellent reasons by those who were organizing the motorcade to issue those instructions. The crowd was allowed to spill out into the street, 8, 10, 12 deep, and notice the open windows, which were not covered, uh, along with the change of the motorcade route just four days before it took place. This is something that does not happen with standard Secret Service protocol. They establish a motorcade route months in advance, investigate everyone who's going to be in any of the buildings along the route, make sure that they pose no threat to the president, and secure the windows. None of that was done here. They also did not valve the manhole covers closed. And most oddly of all, the vehicles were all in the wrong sequence. The presidential limousine ought to have been in the middle, preceded by the mayor and by the vice president. Think of the effect on the crowd. If JFK is in the lead vehicle, he's the guy they all claim to see. They might yell and cheer for JFK and then turn away and not pay any attention to the mayor, whose name, by the way, was Earl Cabell, and who just happened to be the brother of Lieutenant General Charles Cabell, U.S. Air Force, who was the deputy director of the CIA at the time of the Bay of Pigs. Indeed, after JFK realized he'd been misled by the agency in a classic bait and switch, they knew there was no prospect whatsoever for this ragtag band of anti-Castro Cubans 
to actually succeed in their venture. They were landed in a swamp. The claim was made that if they were unsuccessful, they'd disappear into the mountains and conduct guerrilla warfare, but they had not been con trained to conduct guerrilla warfare. So that what the agency and others involved in all of this expected to happen was that the young and experienced president would choose to send in the Marines over having egg on his face. Jack disappointed them by taking responsibility, even though it was not, in fact, his fault that this fell out the way it did. By putting the limousine out in front, it made it very conspicuous as to where the president would be. You didn't have the interference of, of multiple uh, limousines and having to distinguish his location. Jackie had been quite stunned when she landed in Dallas and was given an enormous bouquet of red roses. Nellie Connolly sitting in front of her was given an enormous bouquet of yellow roses, the likes of which Jackie had received elsewhere in Texas. And I think it's quite clear that that was to establish a form of visual identification as where the target was located if by some chance JFK and Jackie had moved to these jump seats rather than sat in the back where they were expected to be, it would have been immediately visible by the location of the flowers. This motorcade was also peculiar in the following respect. All the vehicles were different makes and models and colors. Unlike the uniform black Cadillac limousines you'll find in any other presidential motorcade, and I think this was a very clear way for the conspirators to know exactly who was where in the motorcade by simply looking at the make and model and color of the car. After Jack had been shot and was rushed to Parkland Hospital, a Secret Service agent took a bucket and sponge and began to wash the blood and brains out of the limousine. Rather stunning when you stop to think about it, since that's the destruction of evidence. This was a crime scene on wheels. Indeed, there was a dent in the chrome strip above the windshield from a shot that missed, which the Warren report never even considered, much less explained. The limousine itself was sent back to Ford Motor Company on Monday, the 25th, the day of the formal state funeral. It was stripped down to bare metal, the windshield, which as I will show you had a through and through hole, was replaced, which meant of course that this vehicle, which had properly belonged in the Smithsonian, was completely bereft of any evidence whatsoever regarding the crime that had been committed here, no less than the assassination of the 35th President of the United States. And instead of blocking off traffic from Dealey Plaza, it was allowed to drive through as though nothing of special import had occurred. This is not long after the assassination. Traffic was allowed to run through, crowds to mill around. No effort was made to cordon it off to conduct any kind of investigation. All of which is either a stunning lapse in police protocol investigating a major crime or deliberately intended to obfuscate any lingering remnants of evidence as to who might have been involved. At JFK was pronounced dead at 1 o'clock at Parkland Hospital and at 1.30 Malcolm Kilduff, the acting press secretary, announced that he had died. He said it was a simple matter of a bullet right through the head pointing to his right temple and attributing that finding to Admiral George Berkeley, who was the president's personal physician. Another oddity about this motorcade, by the way, was that the president's military aide, who would normally have sat in the front seat, in between William Greer, the driver, and Roy Kellerman, the agent in charge, was moved to the last vehicle, as was his personal physician. So that had, in fact, there been a need to get Admiral Galloway to JFK, the arrangement was such that it created maximum obstacles to his gaining access to the president. Now the Secret Service and the FBI already the day of the assassination concluded that there had been three shots with three hits. That a first shot had hit JFK in the back, about five and a half inches below the collar to the right of the spinal column, a shallow shot that didn't go anywhere, about as deep as the second knuckle on your little finger. The John Connolly had been shot in the back. A bullet that shattered a rib, exited his chest, went into his right wrist, and wound up in his left thigh. 
And then a third shot had hit the president in the back of the head, killing him. To the best of my knowledge, they have never changed their conclusions about the shooting scenario on 22 November 1963. And the Warren Commission would pros proceed in, in blissful oblivion of the fact that a bystander named James Tagg, whom I mentioned before, was injured by a shot that missed that had hit the curb and caused a cut on his cheek, which you can actually see here, which led the Warren Commission to have to reconsider how they could account for all of these wounds based upon now only two shots, not three we will discover that they were ingenious in arranging that with a little help from Gerald Ford, who was then a junior member of the commission as a congressman from Michigan, and Arlen Specter, who was then a junior counsel to the commission. What they did was assume that the shot to the back actually had come in closer to the back of the neck. This is a diagram shown in, in Gerald Posner's well-known book, Case Closed, where he uses the diagram, of course, where you can draw diagrams to show anything you like, and claims that the bullet entered the back of Jack and it exited his throat. You see, the, the problem they had, as I will explain, is that Jack had an entry wound to the throat. So an entry wound to the throat, he had this hole in his back. Conley had been shot at least once and possibly as many as two or three. But Jack had also been hit in the back of the head and then actually by a second shot that entered his right temple. Now, this took some machinations and I'll show you how they covered it up, which was very clever indeed. And it's hard to believe that notable personages who have been studying this case weren't able to sort it out long before now. But I had the benefit that members of a research group I organized in 1992 included a world authority on the human brain who was also an expert on wound ballistics a PhD in physics who was also an MD and board certified in radiation oncology, which meant he was an expert in the interpretation of x-rays. His physics PhD, by the way, having been awarded by the University of Wisconsin-Madison, his MD by the University of Michigan. Uh, another physician who'd actually been present looking after JFK in trauma room number one when he was brought in and then two days later was given the responsibility for looking after his alleged assassin, Lee Oswald a legendary photo and film analyst by the name of Jack White, whom I mentioned already having shown that there was something wrong with the backyard photograph, where the man was either too short or the newspapers too large. And then another PhD in physics, this time with especially in electromagnetism from Australia, a fellow by the name of John Costello, who, who proved extremely important in discovering technical problems with the Zapruder film, which he has described as 98% flawless, but where I will explain to you how the film you were watching before my presentation began has been very cleverly reworked to conceal major events that occurred during the assassination. So here's a diagram, and this artist, a naval off, uh, artist, was not allowed to see the body. He was given instructions on what he should draw. And here he's showing, you see that hole in the neck, right, base of the back of the neck. And then an entry wound here coming out the top of his head. And there's a story to this too, which is that actual manipulations were done to the body at Bethesda Naval Hospital to make the idea that JFK had only been shot from above and behind more plausible. But already we're looking at a bit of a stretch here just in terms of these diagrams. Here's another. This is the alleged magic bullet transiting through his neck, passing through without hitting any bony structures, and exiting his throat. Now, even Doonesbury has got into the swing of this by suggesting what's more plausible that you have this one lone demented gunman, a former Marine, who by the way took his recruit training at the same recruit depot and rifle range, Edson Range Camp Pendleton, where I supervised recruit training in San Diego in 1964-65. Versus there being multiple gunmen firing from different buildings and where you, know, you have a lot of elaborate cover-up and all that. So Doonesbury asks, which is simpler?
Well, he makes the impeccable point that one gunman and three shots is unquestionably simpler than as many as eight, nine, or ten shots. The problem with a simpler count is that it cannot explain the evidence. So let's proceed by reminding ourselves where those wounds allegedly occurred, according to the official Navy artist, that one in the back of the head blowing out a big chunk of his skull, and the other at the base of the back of the neck. How can we test that hypothesis? Well, one way is by looking at the jacket and shirt that Jack was wearing. Here you have the jacket where the hole in the back of his jacket was about five and a half inches below the collar and just to the right of the spinal column. Similarly for the shirt, about five and a half inches below the collar and just to the right of the spinal column. Some have suggested that Jack's jacket might have been bunched up or his shirt and therefore the hole appear in the shirt and jacket to have been uh, lower than they actually were, but Jack Kennedy wore custom made clothing which tends not to bunch. And the theories about bunching cannot accommodate the fact that on the autopsy diagram from Bethesda by J. Thornton Boswell, we actually have a wound in the body identified about five and a half inches below the collar and to the right of the spinal column. So that if uh, those holes in the shirt and jacket were somehow a result of bunching up, it's rather inexplicable that they should show the holes at the same location as was found in the body when it was observed at Bethesda. And where two FBI agents named Siebert and O'Neill also made diagrams as they observed the autopsy where the hole in the back was clearly lower than the wound in the throat, which seems highly improbable if indeed the gunman was above and behind. How could a round coming at a downward angle into JFK's back at a location lower than the throat have possibly exited his throat? Plus, Admiral Berkeley wrote his own death certificate. JFK has three death certificates. And while he's non-specific about the shot that hit him in the head and killed him, he's very specific about saying a second wound occurred in the posterior back at about the level of the third thoracic vertebrae. Well, you might guess, where is the third thoracic vertebrae? Guess what? about five and a half inches below the collar to the right of the spinal column. And here's one of those attempts to show the bunching up, which as I'm sure you're convinced by now, can't possibly explain the discrepancies when you understand the location of the third thoracic vertebrae, the location of the wound on the autopsy sheet, and the relative location of the wound to the, the throat and to the back in Siebert and O'Neill's sketch. Moreover, the Warren Commission staff used a stand-in for JFK, which had a large patch on the back at the location of the back hit, and guess what, about five and a half inches below the collar, and a much smaller patch in the back of the head, so that even the Warren Commission staff appears to have accepted where this bullet hit JFK in the back. Here's the young Arl inspector now trying to cope with the problem they encountered when they discovered that one of the rounds of the three that they acknowledged had been fired actually had hit, but had not hit, had missed because of James Tagg's injury. <coughs> and here he's using a pointer to illustrate the trajectory that the magic bullet had to have taken if the magic bullet theory were true. But if you look below his hand, you can see the patch on the stand-in for JFK, which, which, which means that a, a photograph intended to illustrate the magic bullet theory actually refutes it. I would point out that they used the Secret Service Cadillac for the reenactment. The dimensions of the Cadillac, the level of the seats and so forth are completely different than those in the Lincoln limousine, which meant that the reconstructions they conducted had no forensic significance. Notice here, you see the difference between the two vehicles. This is a part of a photograph I will talk about several times during my presentation taken by an AP photographer named Ike Alchins. JFK has already been hit in the throat. He's got a hand up. The Secret Service agents are looking around, having no idea what's taking place. Here's the Cadillac, which was used for the reconstruction. You would think the Warren Commission staff must be the only group in the United States that did not know JFK was riding in a Lincoln limousine when he was assassinated. An entity, a five-person civilian board known as the Assassinations Record Review Board was, was created by an act of Congress in the wake of the resurgence of interest in the case generated by Oliver Stone's brilliant film JFK. They had the 
authority to declassify documents and records held by the Secret Service, the CIA, the FBI, the Office of Naval Intelligence, and so forth, where the only person who could override them was the president. George Herbert Walker Bush was president at the time this legislation passed over his adamant opposition. And instead of appointing the members to the board so they could commence their work, he refused to do that and left it up to the Clinton administration so there was an 18 month delay between the time the legislation was passed and the appointment was made to the civilian board which left plenty of opportunity for those agencies to clean up their files. Now it's fascinating but among the very first documents that the ARRB released was one showing that Gerald Ford had had the location of the wound to the back which had heretofore in the Warren draft report been described as his uppermost back, which is already an exaggeration, to the base of the back of the neck. Gerald Ford in his typical misuse of language said that this wasn't to promote a conspiracy theory, but of course no one would have suggested it was to promote a conspiracy theory. He claimed he was trying to get things straight, but in fact what he was doing was participating himself in a conspiracy to conceal the, the medical evidence in the assassination so that we would have a much harder time understanding the true causes of death and therefore a very difficult time sorting out how many shooters had been involved and how all of this had taken place. So when you take into account where the bullet actually entered on JFK's back, you can see the absurdity of the magic bullet theory because as uh, is well lampooned in the film JFK by Kevin Costner playing Jim Garrison, the bullet enters his back and then makes this 90 degree turn to and go up to his throat and then come out again, go into the back of John Connolly and notice the angles of the trajectories. There's good reason to believe that these angles might be correct, but they're suggestive of more than one hit to Conley, for example. One that hit him in the back and another that hit his wrist and went into his thigh. The very idea of the magic bullet theory, however, turns out to be quite preposterous for a reason I'm now going to add. Not only is all the evidence against it, but there's another good reason. And would you believe that this virtually pristine bullet is supposed to be the one that did all this damage? Even tests firing into a cadaver's wrist alone show it had a massively mushroom tip. So it's quite preposterous to suppose that this bullet could have performed all these feats and indeed appears to have been planted at Parkland Hospital, quite likely by Jack Ruby. David W. Mandick, who is the PhD in physics from Wisconsin, MD from Michigan, board certified in radiation oncology, took a patient with similar chest and neck dimensions to JFK and created a CAT scan. And in relation to that, he plotted the alleged official trajectory and discovered that since cervical vertebrae intervene, it's not even anatomically possible. So here's one of those cases where the government is trying to put a big one over on the American people by suggesting a magic bullet theory to account for the fact that one of the shots missed and now they only have two to account for all the wounds and they contrive an explanation that is not even anatomically possible. Now when JFK was brought into trauma room number one, there were multiple physicians present who came in and the one of special interest to us is Dr. Charles Crenshaw, who was a phys physician who was present and was actually the last to observe JFK. He closed his eyes before he was wrapped in sheets and placed into an elaborate bronze ceremonial casket and got a good look at the wounds. There were others of importance. Here's Dr. McClellan, I'll mention later, and, uh, and Dr. Perry, who performed a tracheostomy, a simple incision through the wound to the throat, which I will discuss momentarily. Here's Malcolm Perry with uh, Kemp Clark here, was the head of neurology, where Kemp Clark had pronounced the president dead at 1 p.m. During a press conference that began about well, 1.30 in the afternoon, Malcolm Perry three different times described the wound to the throat as a wound of entry, that the bullet was coming at him. Three times during the Parkland press conference, which, I made it, which somehow never made its way to the Warren Commission, so they never read it, but where I obtained a copy and published it in a, as an appendix to my first collection of expert studies on the assassination, which is entitled Assassination Science, but all by, by itself. It raises the most serious doubts about the authenticity of the Warren Commission's findings.
Here is a diagram, which to my astonishment, Charles Crenshaw did for me in 1993. You would think it would be such an obvious thing to do to have the physicians describe the appearance of the wounds, but I did this and included it as the first appendix in assassination science. Notice it was a small, neat wound of entry. No one who observed it had any doubt. And then Malcolm Perry had performed a simple trach tracheotomy incision right through the wound itself. But it was very clean, very neat. And this was the condition of the wound when it left Parkland Hospital. Now, later, when autopsy photographs are taken at Bethesda, look at this mess, where it turns out to be a now a gaping wound. I interestingly, the World Authority on the Human Brain, who is also an expert on wound ballistics, I mentioned as a member of our group, was named uh, Bob Livingston, who was the scientific director of the National Institutes for Mental Health and of Neurological Diseases and Blindness across the street from Bethesda Naval Hospital, who had called Commander James Humes, who was going to perform the autopsy uh, earlier in the late afternoon, to tell him that since he had heard the description of a small wound to the throat on the radio, that that had to be a wound of entry and therefore he should dissect the neck very carefully and that if there were any indication of shots fired from behind then they would know that there were at least two shooters and therefore a conspiracy. Humes on the contrary feigned not to have this information, not to have learned it until after the body had actually been removed after the autopsy had been conducted and claimed he only learned about it from Malcolm Perry during a phone call back to Dallas but that was in fact false. Now, Bob also received a phone call from Humes asking him what the wound would look like if it were a wound of exit instead of a wound of entry. And Bob said it would be emaciated, blown out, and so forth, which may have been used as a guideline to reconstruct the wound in this fashion. Notice, by the way, that JFK's eyes are open here, which is very peculiar, since, as I mentioned, Charles Crenshaw closed them before he was loaded into the ceremonial casket. Here's a photograph of the back of the skull from uh, the House Select Committee reinvestigation, 1977-78. There's a skull flap here that may have been blown out when he was hit in the right temple by this frangible or exploding bullet, but which appears to have closed back in so that it really wasn't noticed at Parkland Hospital. But what's important is there was a massive blowout here to the back of his head, the size of your fist when you double it up. But it's obviously not present in this photograph. So some very strange things were going on here. The, the throat wound, if this isn't itself a fake photograph, then the throat wound on the body was actually altered. And of course, something was done here to conceal this massive blow up to the back of his head. Here are other, if anything, even more disturbing photographs. Uh, Robert Groton, whom I mentioned before, is quite a collector of JFK memorabilia, especially related to the assassination. And he has two color photographs. Here they're seen in black and white versions, which he believes are authentic, but which I told him in Des Moines obviously were not. That hasn't led him to change his opinion. But look at the, look at the long hair, matted, all this gunk and gore which because of the stunning contrast with, for example, the photograph we just saw here, led David Manick to suggest to the ARRB when it deposed Humes whether the patient had been given a shampoo and a haircut during the protocol, which of course Humes denied. But what are we to make of this? There is here, notice, a kind of a patch right in this vicinity, which appears to be the approximate location where the, uh, a bullet fired from the right front entered JFK's head. In any case, these photographs both appear to be fake, but it's fascinating that they're in the record because they're so inconsistent with other photographs in the record that no one who's past the third grade could misunderstand that these are not consistent photographs of the same patient at approximately the same time. Charles Grenshaw also drew a diagram for me of the blowout to the back of the head. It was to the right of center. It, it was, as he put it, the size of a baseball, or as he also put it, the size of your fist when you double it up. You put your fist back of your head and you can see that's a quite a massive wound. But yet, yeah, here, look again at the uh, HSCA. In the left-hand side, you have a photograph that doesn't show any, any wound at all, but in a diagram that was done, you see what appears to be a bullet entry wound here. This is very strange. And once again, of course, you don't see that massive blowout to the back of the head, for which we have enormous corroboration.
Here's a diagram by Dr. McClellan, for example, or one that he approved of the blowout that looks something like this, a really nasty wound. And I say again, well, how do you compare this with the HSC photographs? This is all extremely bizarre. Here are many witnesses who saw the, either in Dealey Plaza saw the president's brains blown out the back of his head or were technicians at Bethesda Hospital or were present at Parkland, and they're all very consistent in their description of the location of the wound at the back of the head and just to the right of the center. Well, David Mantic, MD, PhD, went into the National Archives to study the autopsy x-rays, which the archives to this day insist are authentic. Here you see a pre-mortem or before death JFK x-ray, and here you see JFK's skull, so you can absorb the approximate relationship because JFK had been a naval officer. The choice of Bethesda was uh, brilliant because if, for example, in the course of the autopsy they needed to alter some x-rays or make a substitution because they weren't showing what they wanted to show in terms of the, what they would claim would be the final result. They could not only get another chest x-ray, for example, they could get a bona fide John F. Kennedy chest x-ray. So it was a brilliant plan. David thought that the contrast here on the left between this very bright white and dark was vastly too great to be natural occurrence. In fact, the normal contrast, he says, is really relatively modest, you know, maybe 10 or 20 times, but this was hundreds of times greater in terms of the contrast. Now, the way in which these x-rays are created is by exposing the object being x-rayed using a stream of uh, electrons in relation to a photographic plate, where the denser the object, the more electrons it absorbs, and therefore the less exposure to the x-ray. So the, the white areas, are areas where something very, very dense was exposed to the x-rays. Now David's observed that here you have in the head something called the petrous bone, which is the densest bone in the human body, uh, in the ear canal, and that the, 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 the back of his head looks very, very similar to the petrous bone. David was at the time extremely myopic. And because he had done so much research in physics, he knew a simple technique called optical densitometry that enables you to measure the amount of light that passes through the x-ray to determine the relative density of the objects whose exposure created the image. He did that and found an area, which he calls here area P for patch, that was far too dense to be human bone, so that unless JFK was literally a bonehead, unless the back of his skull was nothing but solid bone, this was no naturally occurring phenomenon. Now, while in early frames of the Zapruder film, the blowout to the back of his head has been painted over in black, as has been recently confirmed by a group of Hollywood film restoration experts, I conjectured that if we went far enough back in the, in the film, we might so find some frames where you could actually see the blowout. And would you believe in frame 374 I discovered it? Notice it has that shape approximately that of a cashew. Here's that little skull flap which David believes was indeed blown open, but later closed at Parkland so that the physicians there didn't observe it. But notice the similarity between the, the, the blowout here and what we see in frame 374. So the film itself is not even internally consistent. You don't see the frame in, you know, the blowout in the early frames. 313 is the one where he's struck so dramatically. But thereafter, you simply don't see it because it's been pla painted over in black, and indeed the Hollywood experts say very crudely, done very crudely. You know, here's a Jackie who's responding to Jack, and I'll explain the sequence here. It might be striking that she, she seems to lose her face. Now, John Costello, who's the expert on, on the film, says this is not necessarily revealing, though it might strike you as being very odd. But notice here, instead of that, you know, blowout to the back of the head, you see this black patch. And something has been added here, a blowout intended, a, you know, a bunch of gore or brains. We, we colloquially refer to as the blob that was painted in to the film. So they painted out the actual blowout, they painted in the blob to try to create the impression that a bullet came in the back of his head and blew brains out the front of his head.
Here's a big triangular chunk of the skull came from the back of his head that was found in the grass to the left of the limousine the following day Saturday by a medical student named Billy Harper. He took it to relatives on the staff of Methodist Hospital who photographed it and confirmed that it was occipital bone from the back of a skull. David also studied, in addition to the lateral cranial x-ray we've been looking at, which of course is of the skull taken from the side, the anterior, posterior, front to rear, and discovered the most striking feature of it, which is this 6.5 metallic slice with a little bite out of it at uh, 5 o'clock, which none of the physicians at, at Bethesda claim to have seen. Now the x-rays were taken during the autopsy and were developed and were shown to the physicians, although they would later be gathered by Roy Kellerman, who was in charge of that detail, along with all of the autopsy photographs, which were exposed but not yet developed, and the next time we gain access to them, they have these very odd features that I have been discussing. In addition, the location of this metallic slice is at the external surface of the skull. Uh, David did the most meticulous optical densitometry studies and found that this is all completely anomalous. And what we have here is a metallic fragment that was evidently added to the x-ray in order to implicate this obscure World War II weapon, which just happened to be a 6.5 millimeter. And I believe that was all done quite deliberately uh, because uh, if Oswald had wanted, he could have purchased a high quality 30 out 6, 30, 30, whatever on virtually any corner store in Dallas without even showing any identification. Instead, they get this weapon, this Manlicher Carcano, through a mail order to a sporting goods store in Chicago, and it's delivered to him under the name Alec Heidel, about which more later, which he hadn't even authorized to receive mail in his, in his post box. So something is quite strange here, and of course what's going on is that they are creating this mail trail, paper trail, in order to implicate him in a crime he did not commit. Now David also studied the, the lateral cranial in terms of a distribution of metallic particles, which can be seen here. And indeed, these metallic particles appear to be residue from the frangible exploding bullet that entered JFK's right temple and blew his brains out the back of his already weakened cranium, uh, where there's a subtlety too that I'll get to when it comes to the kinds of brain tissue that we're extruding at, at Parkland Hospital. But this is a quite stunning evidence that the Warren Commission did not acknowledge nor attempt to explain, since of course it would have indicated a shot had entered his right temple from the right front, where Lee Oswald ostensibly was not located. Here's a diagram with a brain where you have the, the cerebellum, this compact part of the brain, and the cer cerebrum. Uh, if, if, if you had extruding cerebellum or cere cerebrum, they would look very different. The cerebellum would have a kind of a reddish hamburger-like cast. The cerebrum would be more whitish and maggoty, so that even a first-year student would have a difficult time confounding them. What we have is physician after physician at Parkland, uh, Dr. Crenshaw, Dr. Jenkins, Dr. Carrico, Dr. Perry, Dr. McClellan, Dr. Baxter, uh, Kemp Clark, all reporting seeing cere cerebellar as well as cerebral tissue extruding from this massive wound to the back of the head. Now that's extremely important because the brain shown in diagrams and photographs in the National Archives shows a virtually intact brain with a completely intact cerebellum which led Bob Livingston, who just happens to be a world authority on the human brain, to conclude that it simply cannot be true that the cerebellum could have been seen extruding from the occipital parietal wound by several experienced and thoroughly competent physicians, where Dallas at the time may have been the homicide capital of the universe. And for the same brain to be seen in superior and lateral photographs and depicted in a drawing, superior view, showing the cerebellum as being apparently intact. A conclusion is obligatorily forced that the photographs and drawings of the brain in the National Archives are those of some brain other than that of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Now, I believe the explanation is this that once they patched up that massive blowout to the back of the head, there was nowhere for all that brain tissue to go, so all, even though he lost a third to a half of his brains in Dealey Plaza, 
they simply substituted another brain, which is actually an abnormally large brain that had virtually no damage at all, for that of JFK. I mean, the, the arrogance and the brazenness of the deception were simply astonishing. Now here we have a, a, a phone interview from May 26, 1992 uh, from Thomas F. and Robinson who was the mortician who pre prepared the body for a funeral and Joe West who was an independent investigator who took these notes and Joe was asking Thomas Evan Robinson about the wounds large gaping hole in back of head patched by stretching a piece of rubber over it he thinks the skull was full of plaster, plaster of Paris there was a smaller wound in the right temple crescent shaped flap down three inches now he's talking about that skull flap but there was a smaller entrance wound in the right temple. There were approximately two small shrapnel wounds in the face he packed with wax. What he found was when he tried to embalm the body, embalming fluid leaked out of these little wounds in the face, which I shall explain momentarily. The wound in the back was five to six inches below the shoulder to the right of the backbone. Notice how consistent that is with everything else we've discovered. Now I believe that the, the, the neck was so emaciated that there was little he could say to describe it and he doesn't mention anything here. He does observe that the adrenaline gland and the brain were removed, that other organs were removed and then put back. No swelling or discoloration of the face which means that he died instantly. It appears that we had this uh, you know, pretense that he was still alive so that because JFK was Catholic a, a priest could arrive to administer last rites before they pronounced him dead. Now we have this most bizarre situation in diagrams of David Lifton who published a brilliant book about the medical evidence inside of, entitled Best Evidence in 1980. We have this you know fist-sized blowout of the back of the head seen in, in Parkland Hospital. Then by the time the, the autopsy report is completed, this has grown enormously, this much larger wound. So I think of this as the, the heel, the fist size is the heel of what becomes a footprint. And then astonishingly, when the House Select Committee reinvestigates the case, it's, it's gone. It's all gone. It's all gone. Now, a very famous forensic pathologist by the name of Sarah Wecht, whom you have probably all heard of before, he's frequently on television, is called in on a lot of uh, celebrity deaths and the like, was a member of the medical panel. And while Cyril has vehemently protested the magic bullet theory as a manifest absurdity, he has never, to the best of my knowledge, addressed the massive discrepancy here between the Bethesda autopsy report that shows this massive wound and the drawings and photographs he was shown as a member of the HSCA medical panel. I was so troubled by this that I actually called Cyril, whom I know, and asked him how could it have been the case that the members of the HSC medical panel had not come to grips with the discrepancy between the, the uh, autopsy report and what they were confronting. And Cyril, very much to my disappointment, said that he would have to check his notes and get back to me. <laughs> he would have to check his notes and get back to me. Very troubling. Most of us in the 9-11 community, in the JFK research community, have admired Cyril Weck, but here I think I may have stumbled over his Achilles heel. No one with a remote degree of competence could mistake the difference. In fact, this wound is so massive that David Lifton, when he discovered the description and the dimensions of the wound in the official autopsy report, called a, a friend with a forensic background and asked what that sounded like to him, and it said it sounded as though the victim had been hit in the head with an axe. Well, notice there's no consistency here whatsoever. This ought to have been the major focus of the HSCA panel, but in order to get anywhere on that, we're going to have to check our notes. Now, some of the physical evidence was also anomalous. For example, Lee Oswald is alleged to have brought his Mandlicker Carcano, either assembled or disassembled, into the building in a paper bag. This is purported to be the paper bag. Well, anyone who has any experience with weapons, you know, knows they tend to be oily, uh, and they're also made of steel, which is very unforgiving. If that had been in this paper bag, it would have been all oily and torn. This paper bag looks like it just came from the Franklin Five and Dime. This is obviously staged evidence. 
Allegedly, the rifle was wrapped in this blanket in the home of a woman named Ruth Payne, who actually turns out to have been an agent for the CIA. Here we see shell casings from the Officer Tippett shooting and the revolver, alleged now since they messed with the evidence to have fired them. But notice here, and this is quite stunning, you have two spent shell casing and one unspent shell casing, allegedly from the sniper's lair. But how is that possible? This clip, as I mentioned before, can only be loaded if it has seven rounds. So there had to be seven in total somehow. The claim has been made repeatedly that he had three spent shells and then there was one unspent shell, but that doesn't add up to seven either. And the fact that there are only two here in this evidence photograph, which was published in JFK Assassination followed by Jesse Curry, who was the chief of police at the time of the assassination, is very disturbing. And it's compounded by an FBI evidence report, again showing two spent cartridges and one unspent. So what happened here? Did Oswald, who actually wasn't even on the sixth floor, only fire two? And there was one unspent? And what about the other four casings that need to be accounted for? Or the other four bullets? I'm telling you, the, the, the extent to which they were you know, committing travesties because of their lack of knowledge about the weapon and how it functions is, is truly stunning. Now here's a, a weapon alleged to be the Manlicher Carcano that was entered into evidence in Dallas. Here's a weapon alleged to be the Manlicher Carcano entered into evidence in Washington, D.C. And when you compare them, they're not the same. They're not the same. So which weapon, if either, is the assassination weapon? Indeed, Jack White has done another study with yet a third weapon, and again, none of the three match. So, you know, the, the blatant disregard of procedure is just stunning. This is uh, among the last moments of happiness and bliss experienced in the life of Jacqueline Kennedy. As a limousine was turning from Houston on to Elm, this is William Greer, who would momentarily, after bullets began to be fired, pull a limousine to the left and to a halt to make sure that JFK would be killed. And during that interval of three to four seconds, Jack was hit twice in the head. Once in the back, he fell forward. Jack eased him back up, was looking him right in the face when he was hit in the right temple by that frangible or exploding bullet that blew his brains out the back of his head with such force. The motorcycle patrolman, Bobby Hargis, riding to the left rear, impacted with the debris, thought he himself had been shot. Now, my reason for showing this is there's this very peculiar trailer here. Now, a Secret Service doing its job would never allow such an obvious, potentially threatening uh, vehicle be, be present, anywhere near the present. You could have a rifleman in here, who knows what. Some of us believe this was actually a command and control center for the, uh, for the execution of the assassination. Here, Jack's already been hit in the throat. There's a bullet hole right here, I'll show you a better version right in the windshield, the one through which a police officer actually stuck a pencil at Parkland Hospital before the Secret Service moved it out of the way. There's the image in this doorway which looks very much like Lee Oswald, but who ap appears to actually have been Billy Lovelady, but there's something else going on here that you're going to find quite startling, just as I have. The Secret Service agents don't know what they're doing, and yet back here in, in, in LBJ's Secret Service detail, they're already reacting. And here's an especially interesting location. This is the window to a closet, a broom closet for a uranium mining operation that was a CIA front from which three shots appear to have been fired. The one that injured the distant bystander James Tague, the one that hit the chrome strip, and the one that hit JFK in the back, which I believe were fired with a man looker Carcano as the only unsilenced weapon. Now, studies have been done of the acoustics in Dealey Plaza by a fellow named Donald Thomas who came to a conference in, in, in Dallas which I was co-chairing and I spoke to him about the study the HSCA had done based upon an, a, a dicta belt recording that had been made from an officer's a motorcycle officer's microphone picking up the sounds of shots in Dealey Plaza and he said they'd gone to Dealey Plaza and they'd set up an array of microphones to determine where, whether shots could have been fired from the grassy knoll as well as from the book depository and I asked him, fully expecting, I knew the answer already, whether the microphone array was sufficiently sophisticated to discriminate between shots fired from the sixth floor of the book deposit or from the second floor of the Dow Tax, and he conceded no.
they weren't sophisticated enough to do that, and that all they had been allowed to do was not to test for shots fired from multiple different locations, but whether one had also been fired from the grassy knoll, which they concluded had been the case. So the HSC, while reaffirming virtually all of the Warren Commission's original conclusions, added that there appeared to be one more shot having been fired from the grassy knoll, and therefore uh, JFK was probably killed as a result of a conspiracy. Now, I have been told, though I haven't seen it myself, that there's an unsigned document in the National Archives accompanying the HSCA report that says that subsequent studies showed that the acoustical evidence was unreliable and there actually was no proof of an additional shot having been fired from the grassy knoll. But the fact of the matter is just the medical evidence alone undermines everything that the government has told us. Here you can see that, that, that hole in the windshield, there's a white spiral nebulae with a dark hole in the center indicative of a through and through hole. This is Jackie's hand here, her gloved hand on JFK's arm. His hands are up to his throat because he's already been shot in the throat by the bullet that passed through the windshield. Here's a windshield the Secret Service would later produce and claim to have been on the limousine at the time, but it's obviously not. Notice the kind of star-like or spider-like cracks doesn't resemble at all this small white spiral nebulae with a, with a dark hole in the center. And indeed, this is just one of multiple uh, forms of, of fabrication of evidence that took place here. So when we put the shots together, we find JFK was shot in the back by, by a, a round that was fired from the top of the county records building. And it apparently was done to implant a Mandlick or Carcano in his back using a small plastic collar known as a sabot, S-A-B-O-T. Which may be why it only penetrated such a shallow distance about as far as the second knuckle on your little finger with no point of exit. The shot to his throat appears to have been fired from the triple underpass, the south side, that above ground sewer opening I was mentioning halfway between the roadway and the top of the triple underpass. That the shot to the back of his head was fired from the Dal Texas I've already mentioned, and then the shot to the right temple that blew his brains out the back of his head, the frangible bullet, appears to have been fired from the north side of the triple underpass, that symmetrically located sewer opening located there. So when you put together the totality of the shot sequence, we got this shot fired from the county records building that hit JFK in the back. Kellerman, Roy Kellerman even said that Jack called out, I'm hit, which he could not have done if the first shot was to his throat, because once he'd been hit in the throat, he wasn't able to speak. But that appears to have been the second shot. Now many of the witnesses in Dealey Plaza said the first shot, what they took to be the first shot, sounded different than the rest, that it made the sound of a firecracker. Well, a researcher by the name of Jim Lewis has gone through the south and gone to junkyards and fired high-powered rifles through the, the glass of junk vehicles, and he has discovered not only can you hit a dummy sitting in the back seat the way this shot was performed, but it makes the sound of a firecracker when it passes through the glass. Then we have the three shots from the Dow Techs. We have two or three fired at John Connolly from the west side of the book depository where no shots were fired from the alleged sniper's lair, where a shot that was fired here from the grassy knoll actually wound up in the grass, and I believe that, although it should have been the easiest shot, was deliberate because the shooter realized he was going to hit Jackie, and they were under instructions at all costs not to, not to hurt the first lady. And then the, finally the shot was fired from that symmetrically located uh, above ground sewer opening that hit Jack in the right temple. And you notice it's somewhat further down here on Elm Street. Uh, based upon my research I have conjectures, guesses as to who were the marksmen. Uh, this appears to have been uh, from the top of the county records building. Harry Weatherford who was a deputy sheriff for the Dallas Sheriff's Department fired from, from here in the uh, Dow Tex, that second floor, an anti-Castro Cuban by the name of Nestor Tony Escudero. From the book depository appears to have been Frank Sturgis, who was CIA and involved in anti-Castro activities. F fired from here at the grassy you knoll, Roscoe White, who was a Dallas police officer and also worked for the CIA. Fired here, the shot that hit Jack in the temple, in the, I mean in the throat, which was then the second shot in my reconstruction. Malcolm Mack Wallace, who was a hitman for Lyndon, he killed a dozen people for Lyndon, including one of his own sisters. And the shot that entered the right temple and blew out his brains by a fellow named Jack Lawrence, who was an Air Force expert, 
Turns out I learned in recent years that Lyndon had arranged for a shoot-off to determine who was the best marksman in the American Armed Forces. It took place in San Antonio earlier in the year. A couple of Texas Rangers were involved, and I believe that Jack Lawrence may well have been selected that way. Uh, the, 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 there are multiple reasons for my belief that these were the shooters. I'll just mention about Jack Lawrence that he went to work for the automobile dealership that provided all of those different color, different make automobiles for the motorcade just a few days before the assassination. And when he, he returned after the shooting to the, uh, to the dealership, he was nauseated and all covered with mud. Well, Dealey Plaza has an intricate arrangement of sewers beneath the ground that would have made it rather easy to disappear. And of course, as I mentioned, he was already using as his firing location this above ground sewer opening. So there, there's more to all of this. This is most interesting. If you go to Little Havana and go to Freedom Park, you'll find there is a statue to Nestor Tony Escadera, of whom virtually no one has ever heard. But if you ask there, those who are informed will tell you that the reason they have a statue for Tony is because he took care of business. Needless to say, the anti-Castro Cubans who were involved in the pay of Biggs all blamed JFK. The CIA allowed them to have that false impression. He was held responsible for calling off the air cover. He'd always made it from the beginning. There was supposed to be no discernible involvement by American military forces. Uh, but he was, he, was he was made the patsy of the Bay of Pigs, just as Lee Oswald was made the patsy for his assassination. Now, it turns out that I got to know the third of these three tramps, whose name was Chauncey Marvin Holt. He actually was a counterfeiter, a forger, an artist, multi-talented, grew up in a circus family. He was a remarkable shot. He ran a school for assassins at one point. Two contracts were put out on his life, but those who were coming after him got, shall we say, the short end of the stick. He had an interesting life. He, he was at one time the accountant for Meyer Lansky. Now, anyone who knows anything about the development of organized crime realizes that Meyer was the brains that put together the modern Costa Nostra, and that no one is in a more sensitive position than his accountant. Apparently, Meyer picked him because they had a conversation about mathematics, and they were talking about division by zero. And Meyer said, well, division by zero, of course, the solution is always zero. And Chauncey said, well, no, not really, because there are infinitely many nothings in something. So when you divide by zero, the correct value would be infinity. Well, Meyer was so impressed, he made Chauncey his accountant. Now, Chauncey also worked as a contract agent for the CIA. I got to know this guy personally when I discovered he was still around. I sent him a four and a half hour documentary I'd made where we had already, in 1994, we'd already discovered the autopsy x-rays had been altered, that a brain had been substituted, and there was much evidence that the Zapruder film had been altered. And I was fairly astonished, you know, that he was even around. In fact, his, uh, I found a letter he had written from Lemon Grove, California to the journal called the third, then the third decade, meaning three decades of research after the assassination, edited by Jerry Rose, who was a professor from a state college in New York, and, and I, so I sent him a copy of this, uh, this VHS, and to my astonishment, my phone rang at 4 o'clock in the morning, it was Chauncey Holt telling me he thought I got it right, which I thought was pretty good coming from a guy who actually participated in the assassination. He, he was instructed by his handler, Philip Twombly, when he was uh, working at the Los Angeles Stamp and Stationery Store, and he would observe to me how the CIA has all these innocuous sounding proprietaries. <laughs> it was like a five-story building. On the bottom three, there was a legitimate business. On the top two, the phony CIA identification operation. He told me they had prepared the fake Alec Heidel identification for Oswald down in New Orleans. But he also told me that, that, that Twombie had instructed him to prepare 15 sets of Ford Secret Service credentials for use in and around Dealey Plaza. That he was worried about getting the color-coded pins that changed from day to day, but he did get the color code in time. He made them all up. He was instructed to go to Dealey Plaza, where he would meet with a fellow he knew as Richard Montoya, who is actually Charles Rogers. Charles Harrelson, who was Woody Harrelson's father, who until he died recently was serving a life term for the assassination of a federal judge using a high-powered rifle, a very rare event in American 
history, but very analogous to the assassination of JFK. And that after, uh, you know, when, when, he, when he went there originally, he was told to go to a red pickup truck in the parking area behind the grassy knoll, which was used by the Dallas police. But the red pickup truck wasn't there. He wandered around Dealey Plaza. He so, told me he saw more bad guys, assassins and mercenaries, than you'd find at a soldier's of fortune convention. So I went back to the red pickup truck. It was there. He left the 15 sets of Ford Secret Service credentials, and he and Harrelson and the fellow who knew, knew us, Richard Montoya, headed down to a railway, a set of railway cars at the railway area behind the, the uh, parking area, and they'd been instructed to go to a certain boxcar that would appear to be locked but was actually unlocked. He got into the, the boxcar and discovered it was full of weapons and explosives. The train started to pull out, uh, but the fellow who was running the, the, the yard thought something was funny and called the police and they went through the boxcars and arrested these guys and walked them through Dealey Plaza. So here got Chauncey and Charles and, and, and Charles Rogers. Here's one of the photographs, the most peculiar, because here they're allowing a civilian to walk through, Chauncey you can't see her, he's behind Charles Rogers, to walk through this group of suspects, right? I mean, how could police properly allow such a thing to happen? What's most remarkable is that L. Fletcher Prouty was a liaison between the, the Pentagon and the CIA for covert operations. Uh, identified this man, and his identification was confirmed by no less an eminence than Victor Krulak, who was the former commandant of the Marine Corps, as being Edward Lansdale. Uh, Lansdale was an Air Force colonel, later general, who arranged lots of assassinations. He was instrumental in the Operation Phoenix in Vietnam. I mean, he'd taken out a lot of people. They, ta they identified him from his walk, his gait, his height, the way he dressed, his hand. He's got a distinctive ring, and his hand is slightly disfigured. So the question becomes, and Victor Krulak said this in response to Fletcher and Prouty's inquiry, uh, that, that that was indeed... Uh, you know, this well-known arranger of assassins, what in the world was he doing there, right? Well, it turns out that in a photograph I found in Jesse Curry's JFK assassination file, I saw this photograph that had a very distinctive personage in front of the book depository. He's tall and lanky, has his hands in his pockets, his hand at a, head at a certain characteristic tilt. I was quite sure it was George Herbert Walker Bush, who allegedly was not a member of the CIA until he would later be appointed as a director the first time they claimed that a civilian had been put in that position. We have lots of indications, however, that Bush actually was working for the CIA long before. For example, during the Bay of Pigs invasion, two of the ships were rechristened. One was rechristened Barbara, the other was rechristened Houston. And the whole operation had the code name Zapata, which was the name of the Bush oil drilling firm. Here he's actually on a Zapata oil platform here in this photograph, which suggests to me that if the invasion had been a success that Zabata Oil would have had the drilling rights to the entire Caribbean basin. But what's rather stunning is, no idea you have him here, but we have a photograph taken from behind where Ed Lansdale has walked up to George Herbert Walker Bush and is waiting to have the opportunity to speak with him. Now, I can't begin to tell you how damning these photographs are. Here's a guy who's n notorious for his assassinations. And others who have studied Lansdale work have seen signs they took to be indicative of Lansdale at work in the way in which this uh, assassination was arranged. Now, a lot was done with the film. H here you see a frame that was published in Life magazine that says in note six, and it's quite peculiar, this note six was rewritten twice. So they actually destroyed the plate. This is an incident unknown in American publishing history. They actually destroyed the plate twice to revise this note, which says, the direction from which shots came was established by this picture taken at the instant a bullet struck the rear of the president's head and passing through caused the front part of his skull to explode forward. Well, remember. It wasn't the front part of his skull that exploded forward. That was painted in. What well, turns out this blood spray, as I will illustrate, disappears almost immediately and therefore cannot possibly be authentic. Noel Twyman, who is a retired engineer who did a brilliant study, it's about, jeez, 800 pages long called Bloody Treason. If you can ever obtain a copy, it's one of the best works ever done on the individuals and groups involved in the assassination had noticed some anomalies in the Zapruder film, including that William Greer, the driver, looks back at JFK 
and does so abnormally fast. And after JFK is killed, looks back forward abnormally fast. So Noel hired a, a professional athlete, a tennis player, to see how fast he could turn his head and found that uh, William Greer is turning his head twice as fast as is humanly possible, which may not sound like much, but it means that you know somebody who ran a four-minute mile could now do a two-minute mile, and you begin to appreciate the dimensions. He also consulted with a special effects expert from Hollywood by the name of Roderick Ryan. And Roderick Ryan told him that the blood spray here and the blob had both been painted in. Roderick Ryan would receive the Academy Award for his contributions to cinema in the year 2000. Now here you see frame 313, 14, see how the blood spray has already disappeared? These frames are supposed to be, you know, supposed to be an, an eighteenth of a second apart. Well, if this were a bona fide blood spray, it couldn't possibly dissipate so fast. Not only is that striking, and you notice how the blob here becomes rather conspicuous, what I've referred to as the blob, whereas, you know, and notice how black it is at the back of his head. We should be seeing debris being blown out the back of his head. Instead, we're seeing the blob to the right rear in a painted in paint spray. Here I've reversed the order of uh, 315 and 314, which is how they were printed in the Warren Commission supporting volumes. David Lifton noticed this and had his girlfriend write a letter to J. Edgar asking whether it weren't the case that these frames had been reduced, uh, re reversed in the printing, and Hoover, rather to his astonishment, wrote back and confirmed that they had been reversed. But if you reverse those two frames, then it greatly mitigates the back and to the left motion of the head, which in and, in and of itself appears to have been an artifact from the way in which they edited the film that did not actually occur. No witness in Dealey Plaza reported seeing that violent back and to the left motion that's so distinctive in the in the film. Now two women, you may have noticed if you were watching the Zapruder before I began speaking, you have two women, one in a red coat and another, these are Jean Hill in the red coat and Mary Mormon. Mary Mormon was using her Polaroid to take photographs and she would hand them to Jean and Jean would coat them with a developing uh, you know, material that was necessary for Polaroid photographs at the time. So they were having a fairly active interaction. They both testified that when the president came into view they stepped into the street, Jean Hill called up, hey Mr. President, look over here, we want to take your picture. And Mary took her picture, a very famous photograph that is, according to the government, taken just a fraction of a second after JFK is hit in the right temple. You can actually see a clump of his, of his uh, scalp seems to be here on his right shoulder. But yet, you know, while this photograph is supposed to be untouched, I'm not so sure about that because we should have had all that debris coming out the back of his head. In fact, the back of the trunk was so littered with JFK's brains that Secret Service agents who saw the limousine in Washington, D.C. became nauseated at the sight. And yet in the film, today you'll see it's perfectly clear and tidied up. Here's Jack White, who noticed there was an interesting feature, structural feature, uh, at the Bergola area, which allowed you to create a line of sight on which the photograph had to be taken. David Mantic and I went down to Dealey Plaza and used the photograph as a, you know, to determine the position from which the photograph was taken, and indeed it had to have been taken from in the street, unless Mary Mormon was a midget. So, you know, here we have interesting scientific evidence of fabrication. It's very interesting if you um, follow the history and get into the details how Gary Mack, who at one time was a very good researcher and who with Jack White discovered the presence of someone called Badge Man, uh, who, who, who appears to have been you know, one of the shooters, actually, Roscoe White, who was wearing a police uniform in, in the Mormon photograph, but has now gone over to the dark side, as I would put it. He's now the, uh, the, the curator for the Sixth Floor Museum, which runs, uh, a, a, in my opinion, disinformation campaign. They won't carry any of my books, for example. They won't carry Noel Twyman's book. They won't carry David Lifton's book, Best Evidence. Uh, they won't carry the, the five volume book prepared by Douglas Horn, who was the chief analyst for military affairs by the Assassination Records Review Board, all of which demonstrate massive duplicity in the evidence, so that when I founded this research group in 1992, our primary task was to sort out the authentic from the inauthentic, because once you discover which evidence is authentic, it's not very difficult to figure out what actually happened to JFK. So here's Mary Mormon and Jean Hill, and th this is right about the time that the limit stop is taking place. Here is Clint Hill. Now what's fascinating about this is Clint Hill for 47 years, 
And I'm talking about up until last year when he gave a, a discussion about his actions in Dealey Plaza at the time of the assassination, has maintained that he rushed up to the limo, he climbed on the back of the limo, he pushed Jackie down in the seat, he lay across their bodies, he looked down at the back of JFK's head and saw this gaping fist-sized hole, he turned to his colleagues and gave him a thumb down, all before the limousine reached the triple underpass. Obviously, you do not see that in the film today. Indeed, what appears to have happened is that uh, once they excluded the limo stop, there just wasn't any time for Clint Hill to do all the things he had done. So here you have, the, the apart from the actual shooting at JFK, the most dramatic activity that takes place in the Zapruder film is Clint Hill's action. And here by Clint Hill's own report, and we have written reports and oral reports over 47 years, contradicts the authenticity of the film, such that I've uh, published published a piece about it entitled, uh, uh, Who's Telling the Truth, Clint Hill or the Zapruder Film? But we already knew on the basis of multiple under other indications that the film had been faked. It's just such a stunning example that Clint Hill should confirm it himself given he was a part of the Secret Service detail and one would presume his testimony is unimpeachable. Now something interesting happened here because uh, there were attempts to discredit Gene Hill and Mary Mormon especially when Gene Hill who was a very outspoken person and who was apprehended by the way immediately after the assassination and took a, taken to a nearby building and interrogated by by federal agents who really were evasive about their identity but when she told them that she heard four or five shots, they said that's not possible, you know, and they tried to brainwash her into accepting only three shots, but she'd heard, in fact, more than three. She also later would report that she saw what looked like a little dog in the back seat with Jack and Jackie. Well, everyone thought that was preposterous. A little dog? She said, the president smiled and then he died. I saw a fluffy little white dog between them, said Gene Hill. Sounds ridiculous, but it turns out it was a puppet called Lamb Chop, okay? She'd been, Jackie had been given this copy of the little lamb chop puppet that looks a lot like a dog and it was indeed there in the back seat. So that instead of, uh, instead of contradicting or refuting or undermining Gene Hill's authenticity, in fact it actually confirms it because we've discovered now photographs showing lamb chop in the back seat. So, I know of about six persons who have seen what appears to be the unedited or original version of the Zapruder film. This, uh, they include William Raymond, who is a French investigative journalist. They include uh, Rich De La Rosa, who used to run the JFK Forum, and whose assessment of what he saw in the film, which he saw three different times, appears as an appendix in Burger and, no, in the great Zapruder film hoax. Here's one from Gregory Burnham. What are the major discrepancies in what's seen on both films? The other film shows a limo on Houston Street as it turns onto Elm. By the way, that's what Abraham Zapruder said. He said it filmed, he filmed it turning on town. The Z film does not even, uh, th though Z f testified he began filming when the limo first came into view and didn't stop filming until the limo left the plaza, but you don't find that in the extant film. The other film shows the limo making a wide turn on town, nor nearly going up on the curb, and as though at first was headed to the service road in front of the Texas School Book Depository. Roy truly, by the way, confirmed that. He was astonished in his written report that the driver nearly ran up on the curb. Greer apparently struck to navigate to the center of Elm, the crowd appeared quite animated as the limo progressed down Elm Street. In the Z film, the crowd appears frozen. Notice the lack of activity or response by that whole crowd on the side of Elm Street. It's as though there are, 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 are mannequins. In the other film, the umbrella man is seen pumping the umbrella up and down, not just holding it over his head. I've concluded that he may have been signaling the various shooters to keep firing, that JFK was still alive. In the Z film, the open umbrella seems stationary except a slight rotation can be detected. Well, here's the umbrella man still standing there, right, as the JFK is approaching. And he, he's accompanied by a man standing here who's shaking his fist, who appears to be a Cuban. So here you can see again, there's the umbrella man, and here's the Cuban shaking his fist, and I believe that was a signal to Greer to pull the limo over and to halt there, which, which is what he does. And as long as you're pumping, that means the target's still alive, so keep firing. The dark-complected man with a cap, alternatively named T.A. the accomplice or the Cuban, is seen in the other film motioning with an upraised arm while he stepped into the street was approaching the limo. He, he formed his upraised fist, hand into a fist. Perhaps the infantry man signaled to stop. I have concluded that he was trying to attract Greer and Kellerman to stop the limo exactly where they did. The limo then stopped for two or three seconds, but the Z film shows no stop. 
It may have been as long as four, but probably not longer. The stop was so sudden, so abrupt, that it jostled the occupants forward. A portion of, portion of this forward motion can be detected in the excellent Z film. And that's true. If you go back and look at the Zapruder, you see that at one point, right, as Jack's being hit, the passengers, the governor and his wife, and the, the, those in the front seat, Gurren and Kellerman, are thrown forward. But allegedly, officially, the, the vehicle is accelerated. They should have been pulled back and said they're thrown forward, which means that they actually used a clip from the abrupt stop, probably because they were worried that witnesses might have regarded that event as salient and remembered it. And if they hadn't seen the passengers thrown forward, thought something was wrong with the film. Here you got these, uh, these guys. Here's the, the Cuban and the umbrella man just sitting here waiting. It's very peculiar. Uh, the best I have been able to do in, in, in identifying them is that this, this, uh, the, 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 the Cuban appears to be uh, Felipe Vidal Santiago, who performed many activities as an anti-Castro Cuban with Roy Hargraves. And I believe that my best guess is that this is Santiago and Hargraves. Look how odd it is. The assassination has taken place, and here they are simply sitting on the curb, acting nonchalant, as though nothing had happened? Ask yourself, how realistic is that if they were merely innocent civilians? With the limo stop, Greer turned to face JFK. At that moment, JFK received two shots to the head, one from the rear, causing his head to move forward slightly, and one to the right temple, fired from the front, resulting in a violent explosion out the rear of JFK's head, and sending a huge spray of blood and brain matter toward Dallas Police uh, Department Officer Hargis, hitting his helmet with what William Manchester termed a red sheet, and with such force, Hargis later said he thought he himself had been hit. This most gory explosion of matter is not portrayed accurately in the accident Z film. Apparently, once Greer saw JFK was hit, had his brains blown out, he then swung around and accelerated the limo, leaving Dealey Plaza, passing the lead car uh, to uh, enter Stammons Freeway. Now, here are two more photos of, of Gene Hill and Mary Mormon. And what's interesting about these two is that, as you would expect, if the camera is, is following the limo, then the background is going to be blurry. Okay? You can't have, uh, you know, if, if they're framing on the background and not following the limo, the limo will be blurry if one of them is motion relative to the other. But notice in this frame, both the background and the foreground are sharp, which suggests that the limousine was not moving at this point in time. Now, the way they did this was using the sophisticated uh, equipment technique of optical printing and special effects, where they could take any foreground and combine it with any background, and they could introduce events that hadn't actually occurred. And they appear to have used the silhouette of the limousine at the background as the dividing point. So while Mary Mormon and Jean Hill are actually actively interacting and giving her copies of Polaroid, and she's you know, putting the developing fluid on it and all that, and even stepping out into the street, none of that None of that occurs in the extant Zapruder film. For years and years and years, I'd been laboring under the belief that Will Fritz, the homicide detective who had interrogated Lee Oswald, had kept no notes. That turns out to have been false, and the Assassination Records Review Board released them to my astonishment back in 1997, but I only discovered their existence here within the last couple of months. And in the course of that interview, and this is one of the pages, Lee Oswald says that he was out in front with Bill Shelley. You remember I mentioned Bill Shelley? He was out in front with Bill Shelley. So I went back to the Alchins, right? And if you look in here, right, that's where Billy Lovelady is. And that is Billy Lovelady, that isn't Lee Oswald. So where is Lee? Well, he sat here again. Here's the Fritz notes. This is in a type version out in front with Bill Shelley. And if you look here, there is Billy Lovelady. And look here, here's a face that has been obfuscated. And this appears to be Lee Oswald. This appears to be our alleged assassin. There he was actually in front of the building during the motorcade. He would then be confronted inside, back inside the lunchroom within 90 seconds after the assassination by a motorcycle patrolman who held him in his sights until Roy Truly came over and identified him as an employee there since Truly was the supervisor. He assured him he belonged there. They both wrote in their handwritten statements which were actually published in the 888 page summary report called the Warren Report that he wasn't agitated, he wasn't perspiring, he was acting perfectly normal, except truly added, a little startled perhaps, as anyone might be, to suddenly find 
an officer holding a revolver on them, and Officer Baker added, and he was drinking a Coke, right? So this is all very, very peculiar. If Lee Oswald actually had had anything to do with the assassination, we now know that his weapon, if, if, if Jack was killed by high-velocity bullets and the man liquor Kakano cannot have fired them because it isn't a high-velocity weapon, he wasn't on the sixth floor. You already know he passed his nitrate test. In fact, there were no fingerprints that identified him with the weapon, which the FBI had reviewed several times. And then it was taken out to the morgue where Oswald was dead. And they put ink on his hands. They created a, a palm print. On the, on the weapon itself and put ink on his hands to create a matching palm print so they could identify it as being Oswald's print on the weapon. Where the mortician, Paul Grody, said that he had a terrible time getting the ink off of Oswald's hands. So, you see, this is one reason why they keep such close watch on, on the, the, someone they're going to use as a target or a patsy uh, here because he was out in front and they knew he was out in front. They knew exactly how much to alter of the alternate's photograph in order to obfuscate that information. And because so much attention has been focused on Billy Lovelady, to the best of my knowledge, I'm the only one who's ever pointed out that the face here appears to be that of Lee Oswald, which was obfuscated in the film, a, a photograph, by the way, that was, has in the past been believed to be authentic. So here, here's another. Take a look now at how the face seems to be that of Oswald, okay? You got Billy Lovelady, here you got Lee Oswald. So I must admit, I can't be the first because the guy who created this obviously had the same, drew the same conclusion. But I'll tell you, I've been doing this for 20 years. And until I discovered the Fritz notes and the remark by Oswald that he was out in front, I have never heard from anybody that we had photographic evidence that Lee was actually in front of the book depository. Indeed, until recently, I didn't even know that the notes had been released. So that's very, very strange, very strange. But there it is. So what I've been telling you about George W. Bush and Edward Lansdale, that's also new. I had those old photographs of Lansdale before. I had the old photograph of George Herbert Walker Bush before, but I did not have this additional photograph of Lansdale having gone up to talk to Bush. And just as we knew uh, that Lee was not on the sixth floor, uh, I did not know until I discovered these documents that he actually said he was out in front with Bill Shelley. And now we have photographic substantiation that once again what he said was true, just as he observed that with regard to the backyard photographs, that was his face on somebody else's body. Now here's a photograph from the, from the Zapruder film that shows Clint Hill on the back. And notice they're almost to the triple underpass already. Notice this has to be a fake photograph because according to Clint, he was already on the back, pushed Jackie down, was lying across, saw the huge gaping hole, and gave the thumbs down to his colleagues. <coughs> All of this has raised serious questions about whether Abraham Zapruder even took the Zapruder film. And of course, what we have today is a refashion, so the answer actually we know, since it's a fake film, the answer is no, Zapruder didn't take the Zapruder film because nobody takes a fake film. Okay, the film was reconstructed, they took out the limo stop, they added the blob, they put in the paint spray, they painted over the blot to the back of the head. And if I hadn't discovered frame 374, we might still be wondering what that blowout actually looked like. And this is most interesting because here's Abraham Zapruder who was interviewed on television that night, and he's talking about a blowout to the right front. But since that didn't occur, we know from this interview that Abraham Zapruder had to be complicit in the faking of the film by taking the original footage. How else can you explain his talking about a blowout to the right front that was painted in when the film was revised? So what we're discovering is that the meticulousness with which this cover-up was planned was extraordinary in its detail. Now, it just so happened in turning the street from Maine onto Houston, there was a whole group of six or more individuals who turned out to be members of the Central Intelligence Agency who appeared to have been paying their last respects. This is really quite stunning, but remember, as Chauncey said, there were more bad guys, mercenaries, and assassins than you'd find at a soldier's of fortune convention. This guy, by the way, is wrongly identified as David Morales, who was undoubtedly involved, but is a guy named Push, Push Penny, something like that. I've had conversation with James Richards, who's an expert on the, these, these photographs from Dealey Plaza and has a website you can find familiar faces in Dealey Plaza. Now, just to show you how extensive this cover-up has gone, you know, and it's still going on today, 
Here's a very famous photo photograph, Jack, right above his face. His head is the face of Lucien Conin, who was a well-known assassin for the CIA. So here you have Conin. You know, this actually, this photograph appeared in, a, in the, the Wisconsin State Journal. Because they were talking about, you know, I think it was this Kennedy detail, this book about the about the Secret Service who'd been in, in Dallas at the time, which was, you know, what, what Clint Hill was talking about at the bookstore signing when he gave this elaborate description. And I wrote the Wisconsin State Journal, I said, look, you gotta realize this is an assassin right above the head of JFK. Well, the attempt has been, they, they never responded, I don't know, maybe there was an attachment there and they don't open attachments for all I know, but in any case, they didn't follow it up and it's certainly not the only case of its kind. But the claim has been that this was a guy named Adams uh, who was actually there. And here's a photograph of Adams. So we get, is it Lucien Conan or this guy, Robert Adams? Uh, they claim that you know that it was Robert Adams because there's a plaque, a newspaper article congratulating him for being in, a, in this photograph. Jack White, legendary photo analyst, said he's never heard of anyone getting a plaque for being in a photograph. <laughs> And look what it says, Robert H. Adams pictured above President Kennedy. See, it's not Lucy and Conan, it's Robert Adams. Watch the motorcade on Thursday, November 23rd, 1963. Now, how bad is that? They don't even have the right day or date. So, I mean, you know, what could be more blatant than a fabrication like this to try to create the false impression that it was Robert Adams and not Lucy and Conan? So Jack did a study, and notice that the, the man in the plaza, like Conine, has a square face, a short chin, and his left ear top out. Square face, short chin, left ear topped out. But Robert Adam has a long face, a long chin, and his left ear is top in. So who do you think it really was? Lucien Conin or the man with the plaque congratulating him for being in the photograph? After the assassination, leaving Parkland Hospital, this very interesting fellow is in the company of Lyndon Johnson. And if it is indeed Boris Pash, Boris Pash was in charge of assassinations for the Central Intelligence Agency, okay? So this is very peculiar. Johnson faked all kinds of aspects. I mentioned not only that his Secret Service detail was responding when Jax was still looking around trying to figure out what was going on, <coughs> And did I mention that John Reddy on the right running board started to rush forward to protect Jack and was called back by Emery Roberts who wouldn't allow him to do that. But that uh, Lyndon also had ducked down. He began ducking down even as the limo was turning from Houston on to Elm. He, of course, being fully aware that maybe somebody might want to take a shot at him, made sure he was not conspicuous. And therefore, if you look at the Alchins, you'll see why well, you can identify Lady Bird and Ralph Yarborough. Lyndon is nowhere to be seen. And here, when Lyndon did what was completely unnecessary, he, he waited to have Judge Sarah, Sarah Hughes show up on Air Force One in order to be sworn in, claiming that Bobby Kennedy had told him he should do that, which was a complete fabrication. Here he's receiving a wink from Albert Thomas, a congressman, as though, you know, this was the culmination of what they'd been planning all along. And I dare say what I suggested to you at the beginning about Lyndon getting on the ticket appears to have been the plan they had all along. And if you want a brilliant book about this, you want to track down Phil Nelson's LBJ mastermind of JFK's assassination. He was the pivotal figure. After all, he was the guy who was going to succeed him in office. He's the one who could make sure that no one would ever be prosecuted or punished for participating in the assassination. Here, of course, we had Lee Oswald being taken out. I mean, he wasn't supposed to still be alive. He should have been taken out at the, at the theater if Officer Baker hadn't actually shot him down in the lunchroom, which I believe was his original uh, uh, assignment, except that Roy truly came over and therefore would have witnessed that there was no justification for the shooting. So it's left up to Jack Ruby. Jack Ruby, interestingly, back in the 1940s, was an investigator for a young congressman from California by the name of Richard Nixon. And the fact of the matter is that the night before the assassination, 
There was a, what I take to be a ratification meeting at the home of Clint Murchison, one of the great oil barons of the time, where Jay, which was attended by Madeline Duncan Brown, a mistress of Lyndon, by whom he had a son, not his only child out of wedlock, but his only male offspring. And Madeline said that there was a small group, a couple dozen, but some rather prominent people, including J. Edgar Hoover, who frequently visited Dallas on his way to the Del Mar racetrack in California. When Hoover laid down a bet, he invariably won, Turns out Del Mar is actually owned by Clint Murchison. So J. Edgar was there, Richard Nixon was there, Madeline remembered very clearly because he'd been driven out there by a local Republican leader who worked in the same bank building where she was a young advertising executive. Uh, J John J. McCloy was there, our former High Commissioner to Germany, former Chief Executive Officer for Chase Manhattan Bank was there. When the Warren Commission was arranged with two members from the House, Gerald Ford and Hal Boggs, two members of the Senate, Richard Russell and John Sherman Cooper, and two civilians. The two civilians were appointed were John J. McCloy and Alan Dulles, whom JFK had sacked as director of the CIA. That's quite remarkable. So, so McCloy was also there. George Brown of Brown and Root, now part of Halliburton, was there when the Vietnam War went down. Brown and Root got a, a billion dollars to dredge a new bay at Comra, a new port at Comron Bay, even though Vietnam has many magnificent natural ports, and I frankly doubt there was any need for it whatsoever. Uh, and late in the evening, uh, Lyndon showed up unexpectedly, unexpectedly to the others present, and all these heavy hitters disappeared into a boardroom. And after 15 or 20 minutes, she said, uh, Lyndon strode over told her, toward her. She thought he was going to whisper sweet nothings. Instead, he told her in a hateful tone of voice that after tomorrow, he wasn't going to have to put up with embarrassment from those Kennedy boys any longer. During a rendezvous at the Driscoll Hotel in Austin, Texas, on New Year's Eve, six weeks later, she confronted Lyndon with rumors rampant in Dallas at the time that he'd been involved since no one stood to gain more personally. Lyndon blew up at her and told her the CIA and the oil boys had decided that Jack had to be taken out. Madeline's story has been corroborated by Billy Saul Estes, the Texas Wheeler dealer, made a lot of money for Lyndon and Conley and, and others with scams in his book, A Texas Legend, where he explains that Lyndon sent Cliff Carter, his chief administrative assistant, down to Dallas to make sure all the arrangements were in place for the assassination, and that during conversations he had with Cliff Carter and Malcolm Mac Wallace, around this time, he formed the indelible impression that they'd both been involved in the assassination, all of which has been further corroborated, a sliver of it by Barr McClellan in his book Blood, Money, Power, where he reports that a law firm for which he worked was involved too in planning for the assassination, but also by E. Howard Hunt, who was, of course, a, a, a well-known spy master for the CIA, may have plotted many of its activities, probably better known for the books he wrote rather than for his actual daring do, who said he was a backbencher in Dallas, meaning he didn't actually participate, and he was not, I'm quite sure, the third tramp, even though there have been those who argued that he was, who gave a, a, a last testament to his son, St. John, that was published in Rolling Stone under the title The Final Confession of E. Howard Hunt, where he identified those who had been involved in the assassination as including Lyndon Johnson, uh, Court Meyer, who was then in charge of covert ops for the CIA, uh, David Apley Phillips, who was in charge of Western Hemisphere for the CIA, uh, Will William Harvey, uh, and David Sanchez Morales, both of whom were notorious assassins. The interesting aspect of uh, Ruby, not just that he worked for Richard Nixon when Nixon was a young congressman, uh, and had a lot of ties with the mob, so that there's this phenomenal increase in phone calls to Jack Ruby in Dallas, where he ran a, a, a strip joint called the Carousel Club, where half the Dallas police force used to hang out, and where you know Beverly Oliver, who was then a young singer at an adjacent club, had come one evening when she was only 17 years old, and Jack Ruby had introduced her to Lee Oswald, as Lee Oswald from the CIA, uh, Madeline and I would uh, later appear on um, Jesse Ventura's America when he did a show on the JFK, one of only eight he produced, where Madeline talked about seeing the blowout to Jack's head at the back of his skull. Audrey Reich, who was the ambulance driver who helped to lift his body into the ceremonial casket, mentioned feeling this massive defect at the back of his head. And I explained how it had been covered up, that they'd altered the x-rays to conceal it. Ruby appears to have been one of the only conspirators with a conscience. He said that if 
someone else had been vice president, he suggested, for example, I, Adelaide Stevenson, none of this would have happened. And that those who were involved here had very tangible motives. Jack had been threatening to destroy the CIA into a thousand pieces. He was going to cut the oil depletion allowance. Uh, he had, had refused to invade Cuba against the unanimous recommendations of the Joint Chiefs. He had signed an above-ground test ban treaty with the Soviet Union against the unanimous opposition. Now he was going to pull our forces out of Vietnam, where they thought a stand had to be taken against international godless communism. The mob was upset with Jack because Bobby was cracking down on organized crime for the first time in its history. Ironically, although J. Edgar had all these sex dossiers on members of Congress and the Senate, the mob had its own sex dossier on J. Edgar, who had been photographed in a compromising position with his close personal friend Clyde Tolson. <laughs> and as one who had long known of this, I've been simply astonished that the new film out, J. Edgar, starring Leonardo DiCaprio, not only doesn't avoid this subject, but makes it central to the film. So I say, well, you're going to learn something you didn't know before about this director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, our nation's leading law enforcement official, who actually took to calling the FBI headquarters SOG for seat of government, because administrations would come and go, but the FBI was forever. Now, it's often been said that, you know, Jack Valenti, for example, who was an aide to Lyndon Johnson before he went to Hollywood and became the czar of, of the film industry, and who sought to undermine Oliver Stone's film JFK, which I have no doubt would have won the Academy Award had it not been for Jack Valenti's lobbying against it, where instead the, the Academy Award that year went to a film about a sadistic cannibal Silence of the Lambs, no comparison. I mean, you know, one is a magnificent achievement and the other is not. But the fact of the matter is, Jack Lenny would claim we know it was no conspiracy because no one had talked, but plenty of people talked. This is from a single page of Noel Twyman, page 285. Carlos Marcello, Santo Traficante, uh, Johnny Rosselli, uh, all talked about it. Sam Giancana talked about it before he got whacked himself when he was being called before the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Stephen Atlee Phillips, Lyndon, as I already explained, told Madeline, Marie, M Marita Lorenz uh, told of Frank Chur Sturgis, whom I believe fired those shots that hit Conley, told her a group of anti-Castro Cubans had been involved, and not only anti-Castro Cubans. See, I think the genius of this, you got one who's a sh deputy sheriff, you got one who's an anti-Castro Cuban, you got one who's a CIA guy, you got one who's a Dallas Police Department, you got one who's a military expert, then you got Lyndon's personal. See, they were all tied together in a blunt oath. If anyone, you know, talked, it would implicate all the other. So I think it was part of the clever strategy to have this highly unusual assortment of shooters. But in addition, Chauncey Holt talked about it. Charles Harrelson talked about it. He actually uh, said he'd fired the fatal shot, which I believe is actually false. But later, when he was put on film, he said he'd been out of his mind when he said it, and the very fact that he said it showed that he was out of his mind, which just reflects the intelligence of these people. I mean, Chauncey Holt was a brilliant, absolutely brilliant guy. Charles Harrelson, very intelligent. Jim Hicks said that he was a uh, communication a coordinator for the assassination, and there's photographs of him in Dealey Plaza with an antenna hanging out of his back pocket. Jack Ruby, as I say, was very candid in the, in the aftermath. He tried to talk Earl Warren into taking him to Washington, where he felt he could talk more openly. He believed he'd been injected with cancer cells. I think that's exactly what happened. There's a very unusual story uh, of a young woman, a brilliant cancer student, went from high school in Bradenton up to New Orleans uh, by uh, Alton Oxner, who was a very prominent prominent physician there with promises of getting her into medical school directly, and she got engaged in a cancer research project with uh, David Ferry, Lee Oswald, a woman named Mary Sherman. She's written about it in a book entitled Me and Lee. Her name Judith Ferry Baker. I've gotten to know her. I interviewed her 15 times for my radio program. You can find the interviews on James Fetzer News. Uh, I, I got involved in the longest thread in the history of the Education Forum, which is a research uh, you know, online website, and it ran, we had thousands of posts about 
about Judith, and I'm convinced that she's the real deal, but others remain skeptics. And of course, Billy Saul Estes wrote about it in his book of Texas Legends, other stuff about no one talking is simply nonsense. So you put all this together, the role of the Secret Service and so forth, you can go all through all the different theories that it was Castro, that it was the Russians, uh, that it was just anti-Castro Cubans on their own, whatnot. The only one that fits, however, is it was a, the ultimate black op with the CIA involved, but also local law enforcement. Uh, the mob was hovering in the background. No doubt it was the mob that forced Ruby to shoot Oswald to silence him because he knew too much. But this has to have been like the most elaborate murder in the history of the United States. And from everything I've said to you, it must be clear to you now why it was so complicated that it's taken, you know, four decades or more to sort it out. But if you even just went to the, this is the New York Times paperback edition of the Warren Report. Look here, that, 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 that hole, that location for the shot in the back isn't at the base of the back of the neck. So it can't account for the shot to the throat and therefore something is wrong. And here you have that photograph of the man Manlicker Carcano with a clip. You know, if people just don't know enough or if they're wanting to cover it up. Let me tell you a very sad story. In 1977, Carl Bernstein, who co-authored with Bob Woodward or all the president's men about Nixon's downfall through Watergate, published an article in Rolling Stone entitled The CIA and the Media where he explained how the highest officials of the agency were boasting that their greatest successes had been with CBS, Time Life, and the New York Times. That was in 1977. Later, William Coby, director of the CIA, not long before his mysterious death in a very strange kayaking accident, <laughs> said that the CIA owns everyone of significance in the mass media. I repeat that. The CIA owns everyone of significance in the mass media. So if you want to know why it's been so hard to learn these things, and you're not going to read them even in the New York Times, the explanation is because the CIA has a lock on the media in this country, which continues to this day. One of the other reasons they feared John Kennedy was because he had a brother, Bobby, and they had a brother, Teddy, and they could see eight years of JFK as presidency, followed by eight years of Bobby and, uh, Bobby, and then eight more years of Teddy. They feared what he was doing for the country because he wasn't working for the special interests. He was actually trying to benefit the people of the United States because in the end, the reason JFK was killed was because he thought he was president of the United States. Thank you.